Good morning, and welcome to American University's Conversation with Yehuda Kurtzer and Claire Sufrin, editors of the New Jewish Canon. I am Pamela Nadell, Professor of History and Director of American University's Jewish Studies Program. Before I introduce our guests, I want to thank my colleagues in American University's Center for Israel Studies, Michael Brenner, who holds the Lillian and Seymour Abenson Chair in Israel Studies and directs our center, and Laura Cutler, its Managing Director, for enabling us to host this event and reach a wide audiences of students, faculty, alumni, scholars, and friends on our campus and around the world. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's guests, and I'll invite them to come on camera are co-editors of the New Jewish Canon, a collection of the most significant Jewish ideas and debates of the past two generations. And we'll even hear a bit about how the book itself launched a debate. Dr. Yehuda Kurtzer is president of the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. He speaks and writes widely on the meaning of Israel to American Jews, on Jewish history and Jewish memory, and on leadership and change in American Jewish life. He is the co-creator of the Shalom Hartman Institute's I Engage project, which seeks to deepen the relationships between Israel and world Jewry. He is the author of Shuva, The Future of the Jewish Past, and also host Hartman Institute's Identity Crisis podcast. Claire Sufren is Associate Professor of Instruction in Jewish Studies and Assistant Director of the Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. A scholar of religion specializing in modern Jewish thought and theology, she holds a BA in religious studies from Yale University and a PhD in religious studies from Stanford University. But I have to remind her and you that she and I met when she was in the first cohort of the Jewish Studies Expansion Project a program that hoped to launch the careers of outstanding new scholars and expand Jewish studies faculties at colleges and universities across America. Her position and this new book is another sign of that program's success. Our conversation will be moderated by American University's own Dr. Lauren Strauss. Lauren Strauss is scholar in residence and director of undergraduate studies in our Jewish studies program. She is co-edited with Michael Brenner, Mediating Modernity. Her forthcoming book is titled Painting the Town Red, Jewish Visual Artists, Yiddish Culture, and Radical Politics in New York, Interwar New York. And she is working on an exciting new book project on metropolitan Washington Jews and political activism. In addition to um, this, she also consults for museums including Cleveland's Maltz Museum, and she is Senior Historical Consultant for Washington, D.C.'s own forthcoming Capital Jewish Museum. So I will turn this over to um, our guests. Thank you for joining us today. Huda, you're on mute. Thank you so much, Pam. Um, good morning, everyone. And I'm very, I'm very excited to see you, um, even though I can't see most of you. And uh, you know, the miracle of Zoom again uh, brings us all together. So silver lining, um, I guess, and this really is a, a beautiful silver lining because I'm, I've been excited about this book and I've been excited about this conversation uh, for a while. <clears throat> I will remind Claire and Yehuda that we have a lot of students on this Zoom um, and uh, several of them, uh, many of them are students in my class in Modern Jewish Civilization and in many of our other classes. And so we've been talking about the, the importance of anthologies of actual Jewish texts that are documents and what it means to both have an original text to dissect by yourself and also what it means to hear about its meaning filtered through the thoughts and words of, of other people, of experts in the field. And that's really exactly what you've provided for the world, um, for all of us in your new book, uh, which we will talk about later uh, specifically, its physical form. So, 
I would love to start by asking each of you to respond to the question, why did you take on this project? Um, it's, it's vast, it's, it's daunting. Uh, you might say in Yiddish, the Bissel Meshiga, that you, uh, that you took on such a project. And of course, and I know you've been asked this before, why call it a canon? Why not say anthology or collection? To say that it's a canon is a weighty claim. So Yehuda, would you like to take that first? Yeah, so actually um, <clears throat> the book came about uh, really for two reasons. One was that both Claire and I do a lot of teaching, Claire in the university context, I threw, uh, my, my teaching is primarily through the Hartman Institute and both of us in the context of that teaching found ourselves uh, oftentimes using relatively recent pieces that we were treating as primary texts. And in essence, craving a textbook of the recent past that would kind of fill the gap of, it's not, it's, you know, we have other textbooks of modern Jewish thought, but they end at an earlier period. So in many ways, we were building the textbook that we wanted for ourselves to do this teaching. The, the second piece though, which I think is more substantive is uh, Claire and I uh, did a gathering together at the Hartman Institute five, six years ago, maybe now seven, uh, on post-Holocaust Jewish thought, and, um, and noticed in that small gathering of scholars that the language of post-Holocaust thought was still, relative, still frequently used to refer to Jewish thought that ends in the 1970s. In other words, we have been in an ongoing production of Jewish ideas, but the language of what is considered canonical, we can, uh, I'll let Claire jump in first on that topic. Um, that language of canonical is applied to things that are considered old and have passed the test of time. And, um, and we were arguing, I think implicitly in this book, that there's been, a, and, and there always is, an ongoing production of really new and important ideas, and that it's important for us now, both as scholars and as educators and as a Jewish community, to be listening for the, the, the listening for new ideas and listening for the changing culture of ideas on the issues that matter most. So, um, Yehuda, thanks for leaving me the candid question. Um, <laughs> um, but anyway, so, you know, I, you're right. We could have called the book an anthology, absolutely. Um, but we chose the word canon, you know, for a number of reasons and we intend it um, in uh, a way that we've realized that people don't necessarily um, realize at first. So we wanted to call attention to the fact that a lot of the pieces in the book were effectively already canonical, meaning that people treated them as having an authoritative status uh, probably the best example of this is Yosef Yerushalmi's book, Zahor, uh, which is about the difference between history and memory. And um, Lauren, you probably, I'm guessing, would agree that you, you can't really study Jewish studies without reading Zahor, having an opinion about it. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I'd go to hear talks by visiting scholars and sort of time how long it would take until they mentioned Zahor. And then I had like a checklist of everything that had to come next. And that's a book that's read widely in Jewish studies and also um, its ideas filter out beyond the academic world into the Jewish communal world, um, into sermons, into um, you know, adult education programs and, and probably in ways um, even beyond that as well. So that was one reason we called it canon was to call attention to the, to the fact that there are pieces from the last 30 some years that are already functioning as, as authoritative in the way that the word canon signals. The second thing um, was that we intended canon in uh, the sense really of an open canon, meaning that this is a book, sure. And you know, it had a date by which it had to be done. And uh, it doesn't come in a binder form where you can pop the rings open and put in your own favorite articles. But we see it as the beginning of a conversation so that you know, a program like this where we can talk about the book and we can be in conversation with you, with the people who are attending and so on and so forth. That is in a sense, that's like the oral Torah of, of the book and within you know, the Jewish tradition, right? As soon as any book is finished, it just gives rise to that commentary without which you can't even really read it or understand it. So it's a beginning, it's not on an end. And so we intend canon in that in that open sense. The third thing that I would say is it's a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, who, who could possibly in the year 2021 
accurately assess exactly which pieces from 1980 to 2015 are going to have, you know, truly lasting power in terms, you know, in 50 years, what will people still be reading? Or from a historian, in 50 years, there may be a very different understanding of which ideas were the most important in our time. We have one perspective as people who grew up in the context of these issues, but in time, um, you know, we're, we're hopefully humble and modest enough, uh, we try to be, to recognize that in time, we may have been right about some things. I hope we were right about some things. There are other ways in which um, we will prove to be wrong because the ideas that we highlight may fade away, um, may fade away shortly. So it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit tongue in cheek sort of recognizing that to call it a canon is, you know, it's audacious, it's obnoxious. Um, and we want the pushback and we also want to be able to say, well, why not call it a canon? And in the conversation that emerges from that, good things come out. Good things definitely come out. Um, that's amazingly poetic of you to, to think of that your book as the text and and our conversation as the oral Torah. So uh, maybe the the Zoom recording will be you know the new the new raw material from which the new uh, Talmud is created. Who knows? Now I'm being put to dick. Um, so how did the two of you work together on this? What is it like to embark on this um, project with another person? Um, I'm assuming that you were friends or at least knew each other pretty well. Um, and, uh, and how much input did you have from others once the word got out that you were doing this? Did you have a lot of, a lot of people writing to you and saying, you have to include this, you have to include that? How did that work? So Lauren, you ask great and multifaceted um, questions. Um, so I'll start, you know, so we, the kernel of this book or the seed of the idea really was at that conference that Yehuda already mentioned, but Yehuda is the one who um, I think was the first to really believe that this could happen and sat down and started getting organized and initially reached out to me to write one of the commentaries. So the book has, um, you know, somewhere between 70 and 80 primary sources. And they're all accompanied by um, a short essay by a scholar putting the primary source into context, commenting on it, trying to explain why it's important, in some cases criticizing it. Um, and Yehuda reached out to me to write uh, one of the pieces. And we started talking and I was suggesting um, some other people who might uh, be good commentators. And we quickly realized that we have different overlap but different networks and um, also that having two people on a project would increase the chances that it would make it to the make it to the finish line. Um, I'm sure you also know Lauren that many projects get started and there are a thousand distractions and Yehuda and I both had time to work on this but not the ability to make it our only our only focus and so working together was a way to really to make it happen and also to bring in um, so many other people because of our different our different networks and different um, connections. Um, we had been in a writing group many, many, many years ago when we both lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, before that, not to embarrass him, but Yehuda had been my sister's counselor on a summer program once. That was maybe the beginning of our connection. But that writing group, I think, was an important foundation, and we ultimately got to know each other much better through this uh, through this project. Yehuda, I don't know if you feel differently. Yeah, no, no, I I'll, I agree on all of that. I think um, I, in retrospect, you know, I did start. I kind of started it by myself. In retrospect, it not only wouldn't have happened had not had Claire not gotten involved, um, but also it, it wouldn't have made sense to try to think about this as one person curating all of this content, both because Claire and I have some different areas of specialization, things that are interesting to us. So that became a useful chavruta, a good dialogue around, um, you know, sometimes it was even a test, like one of us would put forward an idea and the other person hadn't even heard of it. Okay, well, what's the, what's the <laughs> argument? Um, so I think that that was critical. I'll also just mention, we had a bunch of research assistants on this project. Hannah Kober, uh, Josh Flink, Sam Hainback, students or recent college graduates, and they turned out to be great chavrutot also, oftentimes suggesting things that we missed. Um, but in terms of your other question that, that you raised, Lauren, um, around once the word of the project gets out, 
I, it wasn't as much like, okay, this is a hugely widely known project and therefore people are inundating us. I did use social media early on in the project, a um, number of Facebook posts, which were really interesting of what's the most important thing that you think has been written in the last 30 years. Um, some of that was like, conf you know, helping me confirm my own biases. Um, it was a messy Facebook thread, as you can imagine. Uh, but what was what happened more frequently is that when we oftentimes reached out to SAS and said, can you comment on this? They would say, okay, I can comment on this, but are you also covering that? And that was really useful. Sometimes we encourage them to include a second piece that we then turned into a primary text. Uh, we certainly used the, 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 certainly the essayists help us build a broad network. I think one of the beautiful things about this book is that Canon is operating on two levels. There's the primary source writers, and then there's this incredible, beautiful, diverse network of secondary source writers. So we built it through that way. So it became interactive with our, uh, with our writers uh, in the process. And there's definitely pieces that never would have appeared in the book were it not for that kind of exchange with, with the scholars who are contributors. Yeah, it's, it's amazing actually to see the conversation even, even static, even in writing. I noticed that uh, at least one case, I don't know if there are more, that one of the people whose piece you include as a primary text is in another place a commentator on somebody yeah. else's primary text. Um, and I realized that because I was on a Zoom with him last week and we were talking about the book. So, um, so I just, I want to take a, a step back uh, a little bit more even, and so that our, our viewers, our, our listeners um, understand, although Claire started explaining this, how the book is constructed, because that also um, <clears throat> reflects a certain, you know, a certain bias or certainly a, a, a moment in, in time or in your own thought. Uh, that um, besides these um, commentators, the contemporary people who are commenting on the uh, primary texts, you have it divided, you have a wonderful introduction, um, and you divide it into four general thematic uh, areas. So I just want people to understand the breadth of what you've collected here. So the first one is Jewish politics and the public square. Of course, my that's my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have history, memory, and narrative. Maybe that one's my favorite. I don't know. Um, religion and religiosity. And okay, that one's good too. And identities and communities. Okay, so that's sort of vague enough, identities and communities, but it's also, you know, even though those categories may seem obvious to us as contemporary Jewish scholars, of course you divide things into, you know, identity, religion, uh, politics, and history slash memory. But maybe that's not so obvious to other people in our time. And also, uh, when I was discussing with my students recently the development of modern historical scholarship, specifically in the Jewish arena, and the kind of texts that were taken as authoritative. Uh, historically, folk tales um, and and uh, you know all sorts of fantastical stories about how things came to be. So those categories in themselves are reflective of of a time and place. Um, so do you want to just say a little bit more about how it's constructed and and who the people are? Uh, not necessarily names, although you're welcome to. But but who you were thinking of to comment on these texts? Did you privilege certain areas? Yeah, I think. Um... It's a, it's a really insightful question. I, I've thought a lot, really actually since the publication of the book about this organizing scheme, right? It seems very logical at the time that we were using basically kind of philosophical categories, those kind of broad analytical categories. The book could be very different by, use, by simply using a chronology of when these, when these pieces were written. Exactly. Uh, and that would generate a very different internal narrative within the book. I happen to think it would be make, make it a little bit more confusing because we're covering a lot of ground around social, political, historical phenomena and the fact that you know both the Lebanon war in Israel um, takes place in 1982 as does the publication of Harold, um, of, of Harold Kushner's When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Maybe they're connected, but I think it would be a, a, be a reach. Um, it's more useful to actually think about them as different, uh, as different broad trends. Um, I, so I, I, I 
that said, like when the book becomes a teaching tool, and I've seen this happen, um, I've actually seen a lot of a number of people, rabbis who are teaching this in adult education contexts, uh, actually pull the pull some pieces out of different categories and look for different organizing schema. And mm -hmm. um, and I I I'd have to spend a little more time thinking about like why it was that I or we gravitated towards this towards this scheme of telling the story over the last 30 or 40 years. But as you indicated, like the story we told in our introduction was trying to create some, I felt that the book was trying to create some coherent understanding of all of the disruptions and dislocations and challenges over the last 30 or 40 years. And by situating them in these categories, I think we're offering some, some implicit interpretation. I think any anthologist, regardless of how, um, you know, dispassionate they would claim it being is trying to tell a story. And I think we are also trying to tell a story here about a lot of rupture in Jewish communal life, a lot of a lot of kind of pulling apart. We say at the beginning of the book, the previous era in Jewish history was about a search for home. We're in a period of time where there's like making sense of being at home for both diaspora Jews and Israeli Jews. And I, and I think that's what led towards these categories to try to capture the story. Um, that That is Fascinating, and I will. I, I want to get back later to that concept of of the two centers because that's clearly that that's clearly um, where yeah. you're going. Um, but I have to ask because I know some people are are wondering um, about the controversy that accompanied the book's publication even before it was published, Republic. right? And um, so it has been accompanied by, by a good deal of controversy. And some of that actually resurfaced in the media just this week, just, just yesterday, Yehuda, I, I saw you quoted. Um, so I don't, I don't wanna skip over that and I'm sure you're sick of talking about it, but, uh, but let's just jump in and um, talk about what the, country, the controversy is and, and more importantly, um, what does that say about the importance of a book, right? To, um, to, to rile people up and bring the publication of a collection into the contemporary debates that we're having. So I can take that one. Um, and I wanna, you know, just for those who, uh, who don't know exactly what you're talking about or who, you know, don't follow the, haven't been following the adventures of the book, uh, about a year ago, uh, last April, our publisher um, posted the table of contents for our book on the page, um, which is just you know part of the schedule of things with when the book was supposed to come out. And Yehuda shared it on his Facebook page. A couple of our contributors, our commentators um, shared it as well. And um, people who clicked on it noticed that among the primary sources, we include uh, writings by three men who in the context of Me Too were accused of and to varying degrees admitted um, to acts of or patterns of different forms of sexual harassment or even uh, um, abuse. And um, in a sort of a flurry of um, comments on Yehuda's Facebook page in a couple of op-eds that were very quickly published. Um, we were accused through this book of trying to rehabilitate the reputations of these men. We were um, accused of uh, trying to sort of either trying purposefully or inadvertently causing um, harm, um, sort of re-traumatizing the people who had been directly um, abused by by these men and sort of assort an assortment of other um, you know sort of related related um, actions or crimes and um, we were quite taken aback um, that people were um, really we felt personally attacked in some ways by some of the comments um, but they were all being done entirely on the basis of this table of contents of our book with very little understanding of what the book was trying to do uh, we see the book and understand the book, intend the book to be sort of a record of the past, of the recent past, but the past. Um, we're trying to sort of say not that these pieces should be taken as, you know, capital T truth from this point, you know, here on forward, but and that therefore their authors are beyond reproach, but rather that in this period of time, 1980 to 2015, 
these pieces were really important. They were, at the time that they came out, things that it felt like, you know, quote unquote, everyone was reading and talking about, or these were pieces that shaped Jewish communal priorities, um, that shaped the budgets of the large Jewish organizations, um, that shaped the educational agendas of, you know, Hebrew schools, Jewish camps and, and Jewish schools, um, and so on and so forth. And uh, we also, um, we're just sort of shocked by the degree to which people seem to assume that if we had put things in the book that it meant that we agreed with them when in fact it was quite clear to us that we were not endorsing any of these ideas beyond saying that these were ideas that one has to understand in order to understand this period and even um, just looking at the ideas there are ideas that that clash within the book we couldn't possibly be saying that they are all they are all correct. And we felt, I think the, the final, you know, sort of thing that I would say about the controversy was, or, and that's not true, it's not gonna be the final thing. One other thing is that um, it's hard to, to, to say something final when you're an academic. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say was we were shocked by the degree to which um, people didn't seem interested in what we had to say at that moment in any explanation we could offer about what the project was about or what our intention was or the you know the regret and deep sadness we felt about whatever sort of re-traumatizing effects seeing these names in print or knowing they would in the were, would be in a book that it that it caused um, we did eventually um, publish some op-eds of our own um, and the, the conversation to some degree died down. Um, what you were referring to in your question, of course, is specifically Stephen M. Cohen, who's one of the, the, three, um, the three men. Um, the others are Ari Shavit and Leon Wieseltier. But um, Stephen Cohen um, is a sociologist who has studied Jews, American Jews in particular, um, over the course of his career and who, is, who was hired um, time and time again by different Jewish organizations to produce studies of American Jews um, across generations and to measure them by metrics of Jewish identity, however, and he therefore, you know, assigned ways of measuring what Jewish identity is, and he very much, along with some others, contributed to the sense of crisis that emerged in, especially in the 90s, the Jewish continuity crisis, right? That, that it was inevitable that within a couple of generations, if things didn't change, if there weren't major interventions, that the Jewish community was going to, to disappear. Um, he has, um, you know, in the last week or so, people have learned about a meeting that he and some colleagues held to sort of return to my understanding of it is to kind of return to that agenda of the continuity continuity crisis and many people have, having learned of this meeting that happened in January have become concerned all over again about the rehabilitation um, of, of his identity um, without a sense that he's really done any um, any chuva any significant repentance or um, you know work. Do you want to yeah, add I, anything? I, I want to add two things. One is a lot of this has to do with the, the recency effect with this book. And it's part of the problem. It's part of the challenge of the book. We're, listen, one of, unrelated to that controversy, this book was not going to make us friends in that we were in some cases showcasing the scholarship and research of colleagues of ours as being really important and excluding others. And some of those scholars made their views very clear to us privately of how could you leave me out of your book? Wow. Um, so, but it, that's, I mean, that's part of the problem. Like the advantage, if you said, I'm gonna do an, uh, the, the canon of, you know, 12th century Provence, nobody's alive to argue with you who was there during that time. So the, okay. the recency has, is a big piece of this controversy. This is a live issue with respect to individuals whose careers and lives are in play, whether on the perpetrator side or on the victim side. Um, uh, and the other is, and it goes back to what we were talking about around canon. Um, a lot of the, I, I find, I think it was inseparable, 
the question of who did you choose to be in this book from who the hell are you to do a book like this? I think those things are inseparable because the whole business of determining, and, and I, this was some of the language that was, was said back to us, that by using the terminology of canon and positioning yourself as canonizers, you were, we were channeling the language of canon, which is about sanctifying things, um, elevating things, as opposed to um, the, the work of canon, which is anthologizing or chronicling. Both Claire and I are historians. Um, so it's it seems obvious to us that like, you know, me too a little bit, but um, you know what I mean? You know, we're, we're both, <laughs> yes, we're both aiming, we're, we're saying these are important. You can't understand the period in American Judaism between 1980 and 2015 without engaging with these individuals and their work. So to say, we're simply gonna excise it from this process, I have really felt would have been irresponsible historical work, but because of that language of, canon and questions of power and authority, it all got inter intertwined. Right. A canon inherently suggests that something is worthy um, and, uh, and, and that the creator is worthy. And this is, look, this is so relevant because these are the conversations that that all of our society is having right now about, you know, canceling and, and yep. whether you can separate the art from the artist or the intellectual idea from the person who is uh, the proponent of that idea um, and whether people are can be great in some aspects and and really contribute a lot to our society and be heinous and and damaging in other aspects so this isn't um, by any means relegated to the subject of your book um, the other the last thing that, that I, I think last word we need to have for right now on this is that um, Claire, you brought up a few of the things that I was thinking this week that the objection I know in the media this week to the rehabilitation of, of people um, who have done objectionable things is, it turns out, is not only uh, related, directly related to those acts, um, that it's also ideological about, uh, you know, feelings about the ideas that uh, that these that in in this particular case that Steve Cohen is a proponent of the way that he conducted his surveys the uh, conclusions that were drawn by the established Jewish community about Jewish continuity um, uh, inveighing against a rise in intermarriage for instance uh, that that these also are uh, parts of the discussion not just his personal behavior um, and a, uh, you know, a, a pushback against the reintroduction of some of those ideas. So it's really, really interesting how this is both personal and intellectual and political um, on, on a larger scale as well. Right. Um, and, and Lauren, if I could just say one other thing, yeah. and it was clear, Claire alluded to this, that this controversy started before the book came out. And, and one of the things I, I interpreted as data that the controversy largely died down after the book came out because people had a chance to read the book. Um, yeah. Understand that like, if you, if there's a difference between, you know, seeing the name Mayor Kahana in a table of contents versus reading a critical reading of Mayor Kahana and explaining why he's significant, especially like in a year when Kahana's get elected to the Knesset. So yeah. by, the same, by the same token, all of the, there are, there, the, our essayists, ourselves included, really tried to make clear that this is a critical work of scholarship, which is understanding and contextualizing these individuals and not, you know, it wasn't like, a, here's the Hall of Fame of the last, you know, 40 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's been a big week in Jewish news, right? <laughs> it always is. Uh, so I want to remind um, our listeners, uh, please, to submit questions to the chat. In a few minutes, we'll be going to uh, audience questions <clears throat> and in the q and I'm sorry, Lauren, in the Q&A box, uh, not in Lauren, the chat. Can I, can I jump in? Yeah. Lauren, I, sorry to interrupt you, but just one last thing I want to say, um, which is that for me, part of the um, thing that this book does, and and actually I, I think is apparent already in the table of contents and was so disappointing to me that nobody noticed, is that in choosing our commentators, we chose a lot of junior scholars. And so even as perhaps we were including the work of, you know, more senior people who are still alive and whose work has been criticized for the reasons you were mentioning, we all start promoting new vo new voices and new approaches in the book. And so there's this tension there between the new and the old. And that's one thing that uh, I just 
sort of wanted to call people's attention to as another piece of the picture and and something that I value is you know the I value the promoting of the new voices I think more than I do the shouting down of the old voices. Um, oh, I, I like how you said that. And um, speaking of of um, contentious issues, uh, not letting you off the hook again. Um, this time I would like to ask you um, about your choices in a different in a different context. Did you make a concerted effort to have certain groups represented? Um, granted, all of these are pieces that you felt and that are serious, you know, obviously defensibly uh, worthy of inclusion in a list of important pieces of the last of, of how many years is that? Uh, 35 years. Um, but within that, there are others that could could have been included. Did you make an effort to, for instance, include a certain number of women, make sure that there's um, some kind of gender parity um, or equality? And if you were doing this book again, which I have a feeling you have no desire to do, <laughs> um, how would you do it differently? And specifically, I'm wondering, would you make more of an effort to include Jews of color or people who identify as Jews of color? So um, we definitely were interested in gender parity. Um, that was a priority. It was very much um, something that everybody was paying um, a lot of attention to, including us at the time, you know, over the five years that we put the book together. Um, and we also were paying attention to um, the two centers, as we mentioned earlier. Um, so, you know, American authors and also um, Israeli authors. Those are the, the two primary um, sort of homes of our, of our writers. Um, and you, you know, in talking about, in bringing up specifically Jews of color, you are, um, you know, that's to me, when I think about how I would do the book differently, I don't actually think about how I would do it differently if that, if I started again in 2015, if I had a time machine. But I think about if we were just starting the book now, um, what would I do differently? And um, that cutoff date of 2015 actually is pretty significant in terms of thinking about um, when we begin to see major pieces of writing. And the book is limited to nonfiction, prose writing, um, but 2015 sort of in the years after that, there are a number of really important pieces by Jews of color that are published in that period when we were working on the book, but not within the period that the book covers. That said, right, if I were to start now, I would probably include, for example, Angela Bookdahl's um, essay about kimchi on the cedar plate, which mm -hmm. falls within our period, but it's only actually since, you know, it's actually in the last year that I became aware of the piece and realized to what extent it's sort of a forerunner of the conversation that has become much more mainstream that I think existed for always or forever, but has become much more mainstream about um, Jews of color. Um, we probably should have had more Sephardic and Mizrahi voices, um, especially out of Israel um, than we do. It's partially a case of what's available in English translation. Um, but that's a criticism um, I have of the book and something that I would do differently. And I would say as well, you know, me too, um, the movement began while the book was in, was in process. And so if I were to start today, you know, and I don't think we're post me too, but you know, with me too awareness, um, I still would have included the three writers that we mentioned earlier, but I probably, Stephen Cohen appears a couple of times. I probably would have just given him one one appearance, and that's one way I would have made room um, for those those other essays. But those are um, hindsight is twenty twenty, um, as they say. But when I look at the book, those to me are the those are my critiques of it, or what I would do differently. Mm -hmm. Yehuda, do you want to? Yeah, that that sounds right to me. I think the Mizrahi piece was a big lacuna in the book. I think we also I think we missed Soviet Jewry. Um, I've thought about that a bunch of times. I'm not sure what the primary text is, but I think we missed Soviet Jewry in that sense. And and then, you know, as you know, Lauren, when you write a book, like if the minute you have it, you're like, oh my God, oh, we've done these thousand things differently and I can't believe it exists in the world. I think this particular question is interesting because of, because as Claire indicated, you know, we, I think 
it, it happens to be a coincidence that we ended the period of the book in 2015 because that, that's when we started writing it it's a really felicitous coincidence in that if if it went through 2016 2016 changed a lot for jews in america it actually changed the agenda in such significant ways so it was useful to stop before that and to uh-huh. note it and to notice four years on that our conversations have evolved so differently. And what I would love to use that to do when looking at the book is to notice there are two issues, for instance, where we track throughout the book, the changing attitudes. One is on queerness and one is on intermarriage. Um, throughout, from the earliest renderings in the book till the end of the time of the book, the ideas have evolved pretty significantly. So I think that's a way to notice, how, for us to notice how we are different also between 2015 and now. Yeah, that that is really interesting. That there has to be uh, there has to be a point at which you stop, mm-hmm. and and also yes, considering the last four and a half years or so, maybe in in that way uh, you dodged some some controversy. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll ask you one more uh, question, then we we have some audience uh, questions on the bottom. Um, we've alluded to it a little bit. Your decision to really focus on two centers and to focus on Israel and the United States. And yes, that is where the bulk of world Jewry uh, lives, um, has for a while. But um, did you get any comments about the fact that, uh, that there are diaspora Jewish communities all over the world that, that you don't focus on? And why? Is it, is it just a matter of numbers or I suspect more of an intellectual uh, decision about the debates that are uh, that are taking place in the societies and the differences between what it means to be a Jew in America and what it means to be a Jew in Israel and or an Israeli citizen, uh, over 20% of whom are not Jews, but are Muslim and Christian Arabs, so. You know, it's interesting. Um... If we, you know, Claire, Claire, my names are on the book. And so what that tells you is that this is the new Jewish canon as we've decided to curate it. And it's something that Claire pointed out kind of early in the process. This book, all, this book tells a powerful story for us about the Judaisms that we've grown up with and the stories that have changed and, and have evolved. So one piece of this is that it's, it's less, I think it's less in our field of view of like, what's the, what are the key texts that would help to describe the Jewish community in Buenos Aires over the last 35 years? Mm-hmm. It's less in our field of view. It's possible that had we done this with a much larger committee, that it would have been inevitable that those things had come in. But I think it's okay to also read this book as like these two American Jews trying to figure out how did we get here? What's the story mm-hmm. been um, of the last bit of time? And I'll tell you, I did one event with a Jewish community not in America, and they didn't even ask this question because they were kind of enthralled. They noticed that this is a story, they're enthralled by this evolving story of the dominant percentage of world Jewry. And yes, of course, they know in Australia, they've had their own stories, mm-hmm. but it's, but it, I don't know, there's something about, there's something about the centers of Jewish life that is a, is a story in and of itself. And I think that that's implicit in the book. The- flip side of that has been doing talks and hearing from people in the audience about the places where they find themselves in the book. Um, That's been pretty, pretty incredible. And, uh, you know, in that way, not everybody will find, not every Jew in the world will find themselves in in this book. But I think that many, especially many American Jews in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and so forth will read a piece and either remember when they read it originally, or it will explain to them something about themselves and where they are and um, either how they've been perceived or how they perceive themselves. And that's very powerful. And um, it's not possible to do that for every Jew in the world, but to have succeeded at doing that for some portion is really gratifying. Do you think it's possible for anyone to create a text that is uh, identifiable <laughs> for every Jew in the world? Um, no, no, no. They would. We wouldn't be. You know, the Jews right. would not be the Jews if that were possible. Uh, right. It, it would be a much, much more boring, uh, much more boring existence. Um, so uh, I want to go to some of our audience questions. Um, someone. Um, asked, I mean, you you spoke about this to some extent, but th- this is rephrased. Can you realistically identify something as canonic, in quotes, 
uh, which has not been out for more than say 20 years, especially with the rapid changes going on these days. So would you say that those pieces are topical rather than canonic? Um, so given, uh, yeah, go ahead. Do you, do you want to answer? Do you want to go say? Ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah, okay. So it's funny, I, I, the word topical um, is, a, is a new one. Um, whenever I see the word topical, I want it to be tropical because that sounds <laughs> so appealing um, sitting in here on a great day in Chicago. You know, topical is uh, Yehuda's Facebook page, right? Yehuda's always commenting on the issues of the day. And for like two or three hours, there can be this incredibly vibrant conversation there as though nothing else in the world matters whatsoever. And then a day later, it, it sort of fizzles out. So I'd like to think, or I believe that the pieces in our book have more staying power mm -hmm. than, or have proven themselves to have more staying power. Some of those conversations, those daily conversations may prove um, to have staying power as well. But I think that these pieces are more than topical. Um, but I think that question just gets back to, again, you know, being tongue in cheek and saying, you know, at this moment in time, looking back, this is what appears to be canonical. Here's a little, some of the book are things that we want to be canonical that we think are really important and should have staying power. Um, but most of it is things that already, that already have. Um, and beyond that, you know, people are welcome to, to disagree, to think it should have been a Jewish canon rather than the Jewish canon, um, or to think that the word canon is, you know, absurd. Um, but these are, we can defend for each piece that's in here, we can defend why it's there. Um, and that's, to me, that's enough. Yeah, I want to push a little harder on that, actually. I, I so, I think canonization processes are happening all the time, but they're happening passively. I think we could all identify like the books that may, were published in your own lifetime that you saw become important to you, become important in your social circles, become critical to your identity, that you can't imagine who, who you are without that book, that essay, that speech, whatever it is. Um, so those canonical, those canonical processes are happening all the time. The difference is that we're saying there aren't just passive canonical processes, there are active canonical processes. There are moments in time when scholars or religious leaders or community leaders sit down and say, let's focus on the importance of this and maybe a little bit less on that. Now, again, that's a power play. We know it's a power play. Um, we happen to be really interested in the version of that power play that's interactive. Tell us why we got what, what you think we missed. Um, argue with us. We built a website for people to be able to submit things that should have been in the new Jewish canon. So we're, but we're, but in doing so, we're basically naming um, the existence of processes that have or, that are already taking place. And my argument would be, when we don't do that work, when we don't engage in active canonization processes, we're essentially allowing passive canonization processes to build the corpus of Jewish ideas um, without our own input. So I would want us to be a little bit more courageous about naming that we're the people who do it. And honestly, I see there are other university faculty members in this. If you've ever built a syllabus, you've built a canon. You've just shaped for a group of students what should be read on any particular topic. This is in some ways um, us doing a syllabus um, for, for, uh, for, for, Amer for American Jewish life over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, and, and I think it should be seen in that process, in that context. Hmm. Um, I, you know, I thinking um, and, uh, and, and getting some questions about this, so I'll, I'll put those together about the fluid nature of, of debates today, things that are available to us, frankly, because of technology. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, and, and I thought of it again when Claire was talking about uh, your, your Facebook page, Yehuda, and, and this is... Um, just reminds me once again why I'm not on social media because uh, I don't think I would get anything done. Um, but we have an opportunity, right? We don't just have a Geniza in an attic in Cairo where everything gets put in and then is discovered by wonderful happenstance. Everything for better or for worse is, is out there. So could this book be a starting point and do you want to, you know, have you thought about 
setting up a kind of a permanent second edition where people can can add or at least have that um you know have that conversation there yes yeah, so that's in some ways the, that's what the website is built to do is to be able to enable people to contribute here's tell tell us why something should be here and give us 250 words on it we are writing a leader's guide through the hartman institute for educators for rabbis to teach this um you know with guiding questions uh, with new categories. What if you were going to take the material in this book and organize it differently? We're learning a lot actually from the way that it's being taught. I hear from rabbis and educators and, and, and professors about what's what plays um, and what doesn't. I don't know about a second edition. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know. About, You're going to break in hives if I say Maybe, that again. <laughs> um, I don't know about a sequel, but I, um, I do hope that it is I really, I do hope for that dynamism and I'd love, and I'd love, you know, for over the next number of years to find out like, wow, we missed, we missed this or, oh, wow, we got, you know, 80, 90% of it right. Right. And what you said about syllabi is actually that that's perfect um, because not only is that a canon, but uh, I, I don't know about uh, you all when you, when you teach courses, but I often ask students at the end to tell me at the end of the semester what worked and what didn't. Um, and, uh, and sometimes I'm really surprised at the way that a certain piece hits someone. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so that's, that's really smart. Um, to a great extent, what you've done is, you know, sort of set your, your work of art, your, your work of intellectual um, creation, uh, which it is, even though it's an anthology, you, you created the framework and you've set it free, you published it, and then it's not in your hands anymore. Uh, and, and so that brings me to another audience question, which <clears throat> I'm glad that someone else asked because otherwise I would have, um, and that is about works of art. Um, someone even said in their question, I'm sure Lauren Strauss is very, uh, is wondering about this since I am writing a book about Jewish artists. Um, um, but, you know, granted this was all texts that are words that were, in, that were published in writing. Um, did you think about even discussing the import of other kinds of texts and is there a way that you would suggest to do that? Could you have included um, more discussion also on, in words, discussion of, of art, visual art, and literary art and, and artists in this collection? Because that isn't really there very much. Uh, is Claire frozen? Turn up ways and one is, um, oh, there you are. Can you hear me? Am I moving now? Okay, so I, I'm going to answer in a couple of ways. Um, is a question that that is imp very important to me, and one is uh, there's a couple of pieces in the book that I don't think we we give enough attention to that are very visual. Um, two, we have a, an image of a page from an art scroll sidur accompanied by an essay about changes in prayer books um, over this period of time, and we don't usually think about. Um, you know, the appearance of a page necessarily as, as a work of art, but having now just gone through the process of the page layout, um, it, it, is, it is art and the visual, it's the visual aspect of the, the page in the prayer book that really, that really matters and is revolutionized um, during this time. So I wanna call attention to that. And the other one is a, a page from a Passover Haggadah that is uh, published in the 80s, the different night um, Haggadah. And um, just the visual appearance of it, if you have an image in your mind of the Maxwell house, um, you know, just pure Hebrew text and no illustration versus this one, which has the picture of, you know, a child and not a lot of text on the page. And how that, you know, an essay that talks about how the medium in that case of the Haggadah affects the way that people um, engage, engage with the Seder as, you know, so many Jews will do in a very short time um, from now, you know, and the other thing that I want to answer in response um, to your question is, um, oh, sorry, there was an, one last thing I wanted to point out, which is there are a couple of pieces in here that exist on video, which is one thing that the internet is amazing for. Um, 
is that you can just pull up, for example, uh, one of the pieces I wrote about is Elie Wiesel's speech that he gave when he received the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. The written version of that speech doesn't actually match what he said. Uh, the video is a little bit different. And in my commentary, I call people's attention to what he does in the video to his physical um, actions. And so that's something else in the book. So the book is not, doesn't entirely ignore um, the non-written word. Um, but in some ways it was a practical decision. We had to set limits. And by, by focusing on, again, prose, nonfiction, um, the written word, uh, some of it is, I should say as well is, is internet-based, um, we, we created a manageable project. Um, could there be a second volume on literature? A hundred percent. We may or may not be the best people to do that. My, my research right now is actually in part on literature. And so that if I were to sign on for a second volume, it would probably be, be that one. But we joke around as well about, um, you know, a volume on the cookbooks published, the Jewish cookbooks published in this era, which have been a major site of, uh, Jewish creativity and Jewish exploration of the past and they're about family and community and all of a lot of the same issues Jewish you know Israel diaspora relations just look at the popularity of Israeli chefs and Israeli cookbooks in American in American Jewish culture today um so absolutely I guess is the short answer there's so much cultural productivity intellectual productivity that happens in these other areas but this book had to be manageable and also had to reflect our, not just our knowledge, but also our talents and our skills and what, what we right. felt we could do. Which also gets back to the, the question of canon. Um, you know, can you have canons plural? Um, and, and this is this is only one of them. Um, you have to. Right, right. Um, while you're talking about visual things, I, I wanna draw people's attention to the cover of the book here. Um, look at the, these little, what you call them in English, <laughs> doodads, um, on, on the top of the, crowds, the letters. Yeah. Right, oh yeah, I guess in English you call them crowds. Um, and, uh, and this object, this item. Okay, so um, I'm sorry, but you know, I like you both, but you know, this really kind of belies any claims of humility. And you know, it's it's not just that you're calling this a canon, but hmm, what is this? What is this drawing a parallel to? Can yeah. you explain a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I would love to. And um, this is um this was a piece of work that was done by Dove Abramson, who's a graphic designer and artist in Jerusalem, um, who really is doing brilliant things um actually with a lot of canonical Jewish sources. I uh, was really playing a lot in, yeah, he's very playful as you can tell in that. Um, as, you, as you're noting, right, we are, we are channeling the words of the Torah as they're written, right? So that those crowns on the letters um, are, are a play on the words of the Torah. But I, and I, 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 I appreciate the lack of humility that's implied in that, but I don't think it's separable from the Yad. The image of the Yad is the ritual object that's used by someone who's cancellating the Torah um, to kind of point at the Torah without pointing. It's actually supposed to be like a way of not, you know, not, not touching. Yeah. It's not rude. And Desecrating the sacred. Not, exactly. Yeah. So, and what I appreciate about that art is um, by making it, it what, what's, what's implied, I, at least that I understand it, with the screwdriver yod, is it's a DIY version of a sacred object. And I think that that's what this, um, I think- I didn't even realize that it was a screwdriver. Yeah, I think that's the play here, is that this is a, <laughs> I think that's what's going on here. And that's I why- I Vanna White. <laughs> I, I think this, I think the art is supposed to convey that this is a DIY project, that the act of canon, that act of canonizing in a modern postmodern world is not the work of, you know, just, you know, the, uh, of the, of the powerful and the sacred locked in a room away from the people, but it's actually a DIY project and it's, it's being engaged at by two, you know, relatively junior scholars who are doing it ourselves. I mean, I think that that's, I think that's part of the play here also. That's great. You just talked yourself just, off of the edge. Um, <laughs> I have to, can I share a quick story? Um, one of my college roommates, um, when I, I 
you know, sent out an email telling friends I had this book coming out. And one of my college roommates was like, Claire, I want to support you in whatever you do. I'm going to order the book. She's Catholic. I mean, she knows many, many Jews. She lives in Newton, Massachusetts, but she ordered the book. And a couple of days later, she called me and she said, Claire, I'm really excited to get your book, but what is that thing on the cover? Like, what is that? And so it was a very humbling, a humbling moment. It's also, and maybe, you know, it's an insider image perhaps, but it also for everyone who sees it and is like, you know, how, how dare you suggest this, you know, this yeah, there's also the person who's like, what kind of a screwdriver is this? Like, what, huh? I don't get it. So I, I carry that as well. Uh, right. Um, okay. I have a couple of questions again that I'm I'm um, going to put together about uh, your your decisions, um, your I guess we'll call them sort of broadly political decisions in a way um, to include or not include certain things. One person is asking about Peter Beinart's uh, more recent call for a one state solution, um, which is certainly uh, beyond. I think that this yeah, is here. Uh, that's certainly beyond um, 2015. And the person says, I ask this not critically, but because I often see such a line drawn on the left side of the argument, i.e. not including uh, suggestions like that, but almost never on the right side. Um, for instance, you included Kahane. Um, and then, so so that, uh, that challenge and then um, I, I want to include um, a question, one of my students, um, <clears throat> Talia Raziel, uh, included a question about whether you, you thought about putting little uh, comments or extra introductions, not the introduction of your chosen commentator, but a sort of an editor's note um, in front of, for instance, pieces by Steve Cohen or pieces by Mary Kahane um, to sort of say, as the editors, we recognize that this might be controversial. Did you think about that? Uh, I mean, in terms of the first, Beinart's 2011 piece is in the book, Fail Failure of the American yeah. Jewish Establishment. Yeah. I feel pretty good about the political balance of the book as relates to Israeli-Palestinian issues. We, um, I thought one of the most significant pairings was uh, George Steiner's Our Homeland, the text from 1985, as well as Judith Butler's um, BDS speech at Brooklyn College. We, we put in the book here the antecedents of what would become a more full-throated call for one state as part of American Jewish discourse, which really has only happened the last couple of years. But we have in this book the intellectual history here. So and I think that in, in that respect, I think the book, book is pretty good um, about acknowledging the, the changing the changing orthodoxies around Israel and the growing polarizations. Um, what's also very clear in the book is there are a number of pieces that respond very directly to the Lebanon war, which is the real, I, I think is the real moment of rupture around political consensus in Israel about the, about the Palestinian question. First, it gets litigated in Southern Lebanon and then increasingly actually gets lit litigated about Gaza and the West Bank. So. I think that 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 one I feel pretty good about the, the political balance of this book. I don't feel that this comports to community orthodoxies that are pluralistic towards the right, but not towards the left. I just don't think that's represented here. Okay. And editor's notes, did you think about doing that in front of individual so, pieces? So we did give our commentators the option um, after that, the criticism that came out last April, we had we weren't quite impressed. So we did give our commentators the option if they wanted to more directly address me too. Um, some took it, some didn't. Um, and we do directly address me too um, in, in our introduction. But uh, you, you know, at the end of the day, um, we really, you know, we could choose today five people we thought deserved a footnote or a little note saying just so you know these people are known to have committed these you know horrible acts or lousy you know are known to be lousy people but and this is I'm not usually such a pessimist but you know they could all be lousy people and we just don't know and mm -hmm. it's really not for Yehuda or me we decided to draw the line and say that this person known behavior deserves to be flagged or in 
you know, I, this person was rude to me that time at a party and therefore I believe they're a terrible person or whatever. Um, we felt that this had to be addressed so much of the moment when the book came out. But beyond that, um, we chose not to um, flag anybody mm -hmm. as being um, a particularly bad person. In many cases, it comes out in the, in the commentaries that are included, especially people whose ideas are associated with violence. Um, but beyond that, um, it wasn't it wasn't something that we did. Interesting. Um, and uh, uh, I want to make a little uh, public service announcement that someone asked a really good question. It wasn't really a question, but uh, made a good point that um, that when Yehuda, when you talked about the website earlier, uh, this person was asking if you could share the name of the website. And uh, so if you want to say it now but we will also when we send a link um, to the recording for this session to everyone who registered uh, we will also include the name of your website so it's www.thenewjewishcanon.com so it's pretty pretty straightforward uh, so we will include that um, and also uh, we're not we're not finished yet but also I don't want to forget to say that we will include um, information uh, for everyone who receives the link on how to order this book. Uh, so, you know, that that doesn't only go through Amazon. Um, so I just want to take another step back because we are talking sort of in pieces about, you know, referring uh, to a lot of the, the authors or issues. Just want to take a minute because um, we have uh, some time to do that to really quickly read the names of uh, some of the, or of some of the contributors or tell people what some of the, the vast number of issues are uh, that you address in the book, just so that people really come away from this with an understanding of how broad this is and what we're talking about. Uh, so you, uh, you talk about the birth of Benny Morris's, the birth of the Palestinian refugee problem, um, for instance. Um, Judith Butler, Yehuda mentioned, Yeshaya uh, Leibovich, a statement on the murder of Yitzhak Rabin, um, uh, Sam Friedman's Jew versus Jew, very well-known um, series of articles uh, that he did as, as uh, journalistic pieces and then a book. Um, and some of the commentators are recent, um, are, are people who have recently opined on the various ups and downs of, in that case, uh, the Israeli um, political political public square. Danny Gordon, Daniel Gordas, uh, Mati Friedman. If people recognize these names, these are some of the people who are writing about in your book about Israel in history, memory, and narrative. You mentioned, of course, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi, Zahor. Um, we have Emil Fackenheim and uh, and Amos Oz. And so there, there's a, a literature, creative literature for you, um, although it's his piece of reportage. Primo Levi, um, not from um, uh, his, his best known, but uh, actually I guess a chapter of Survival in Auschwitz, The Drown and the Save, Deborah Lipstadt, um, Chaim Soloveitchik, Jonathan Sarna, so I hope that people um, who are, are on this Zoom are getting a sense of the, the breadth here. Yossi Klein Halevi, Ruth Weiss, David Weiss Halivni. Um, in Religion and re Religiosity, we have uh, another Soloveitchik. Um, <clears throat> the Art Scroll Sidor, uh, David Hartman, of course, uh, Yehuda, um, I'm sure you made sure that was included. Mm -hmm. uh, Aviva Zornberg, uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, Etc. Arthur Green, and in identities and communities, we have Menachem Mendel Schneerson, uh, the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and, and Blue Greenberg on women in Judaism, Harold Kushner, Evelyn Torton Beck, uh, her Nice Jewish Girls, a lesbian anthology, and Judith Plasco, uh, etc. Label uh, Leonard Fine, um, uh, Alice Bet Yehoshua, and on and on. So just for for people who are listening who are um, sort of in this world, or really if you've read 
you know, the, the Jewish, you know, uh, parts of the Jewish press or Jewish academic and intellectual output, um, that, that maybe gives you a better idea. I didn't want to finish without people really getting an idea of, of the actual material that, that this book is made of. Um, so I want to hear from both of you uh, something that I'm wondering, <clears throat> which would um, probably <clears throat> uh, take us out. I have a favorite piece in this book. And it's the first piece, and um, and it's just uh, it, you know there there are many close seconds, but it is very seasonal, very very seasonal. So your very first piece in this book is Michael Walzer's Exodus and Revolution, an excerpt from his 1985 book, where he of course talks about the uh, degree to which. The, the Exodus story of the Israelites, the Jews, has become um, an, a universal text in many ways, and also what it has meant for Jews and what it has meant for the world. Um, so I want to ask you a, a sort of a double-edged question. First of all, do either of you have, have favorite texts? We won't tell. Mm -hmm. um, and also, to what extent, and this sort of gets back to Claire's story about her Catholic roommate who didn't understand, you know, who didn't know what the what the picture meant on the cover. To what extent do you hope that this goes beyond the Jewish community? We've talked so much about Jewish debates, Jews, 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 right? But Jewish texts, as Michael Walzer showed us, have such universal resonance as well. So favorite piece and your hopes for sort of a a larger life of this book. Jump in. Like asking us to choose our favorite children. I know. Um, can I can I do two? I want to do sure. three. I'll do them quickly. So um, <laughs> for me, uh, in the third section, number six, we have Rachel Adler's um, 1993 piece, In Your Blood Live, Revisions of a Theological Purity. And this, this for me, it is a canonical text in part Lauren because it's on many of my syllabi, at least two. And I usually teach it in tandem with, um, with an earlier piece. So Rachel Adler is um, you know, a key person in the development of feminist Judaism. And in this 1993 piece, she returns to a piece in the 1970s where she had promoted mikvah in the 1970s as sort of something that liberal Jewish women should bring back into their lives after years of it, you know, generations probably of it, of its being neglected. And in 93, she goes back and she says, I was wrong, right? Mikvah from a feminist perspective is irredeemable or unredeemable. Um, and so I love this piece because it captures, first of all, like such intellectual integrity and honesty to go back and say, I've still been thinking and I've changed my mind, but also the two pieces together, we couldn't include the earlier one because the but our, our commentary um, by Gail Leibovitz does uh, bring it in. Um, the complexity of, of a feminist approach to Judaism. So feminist naming women is what it's all about. And for others, a feminist critique leaves something beyond the pale um, as you know, that, that should be completely discarded and that one person has struggled with both, with both approaches. So that's one. The second is in that same section. I'm sure no one will be surprised that I'm trained in religious studies and religion and religiosity is, is so rich to me. Um, but the 14th one, which is an excerpt from Art Green's book, Radical Judaism, and then we included a review and then a letter, an exchange of letters, a review by Danny Lambies, um, and then an exchange between him and Art Green. And um, the commentary by my colleague, Sam Brody, um, says, you know, it's like a boxing match, but how many people really care about boxing matches in theology? And I care so deeply about theology that it's, uh, I love his image of like, people care enough about theology to like box each other over it and we should all be paying attention. So um, that Thank piece. You. And then finally, um, John Levison's commentary about Leon Wieseltier is probably, again, it's like picking a favorite child, but it's on my top five. I, um, I hope you're making people want to order the book. <laughs> I'm going to quickly jump uh, to Yehuda because we're at 11 o'clock. Yeah, so. sorry. I'll right. just briefly, I'll, I'll briefly answer your second question. I think um, 
I, I do think that there's something very universal about a lot of these issues. Some of them are deep inside baseball. Like I'm really happy we have Rav Shagar in here, who's a really important postmodern religious thinker in Israel, um, but he's he's going to be new to most readers of this book, certainly not outsiders. But to the extent that I, a lot of my work at the Institute is actually about interfaith intergroup work, but the way that I want that work to happen between the Jewish community and people of other faiths and other groups is through a sense of intimacy, which is to say, here's how our community is struggling with a whole set of really important questions. And to be in relationship with us is to empathetically understand those struggles as opposed to exploitatively looking for the places of clear overlap, where do we agree? Or, ex or worse, exploitatively looking for the vulnerabilities to be able to, to, to do damage. So I'm excited when I've been able to engage on this book with Christian and Muslim colleagues who are able to say, wow, through, through these debates, you're not hiding the things that your community is struggling with. Really not. This book is, there's a way to read this book and be a little bit chastened um, by our, by the Jewish community. Um, but to say, this is, this is our real struggles and to be with us, to be in partnership with us is to understand us. It's not subtle, uh, uh, but that, that goes with the territory. Thank you both so much. Uh, you've given me so much to think about and uh, you know, and it's an ongoing discussion. So I want to thank everybody who joined us today and um, wish you, again, in the spirit of the season, um, wish you uh, a Zisen Pesach, a sweet and happy Passover if you are celebrating Passover. Um, and, uh, and everybody should have a safe one and a peaceful one. So thank you. Thank you, thank you so, thank so you much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Soon. Bye.